Sandy Kim is a colleague here at 10th who works at our front desk. She's also an administrative assistant for our ops department. Some of you may be acquainted with her. Uh, she sent me an email this week that uh, she gave me permission to share. Uh, she mentioned that several years ago, she felt overwhelmed by the busyness of her life here in the city of Vancouver. And someone here at 10th encouraged her to head away for a silent retreat at a retreat center called Rivendell, which is on the top of Cates Hill on Bowen Island. So she heads off there. She goes up to this retreat center called Rivendell, and she's immediately taken in by the, the beautiful evergreens that, that grow around the retreat center. She is also mesmerized by the ocean views from this place. And as she enters into the silence and into periodic times of fixed prayer with the community, she feels this sense of calm and peace and connection with God. She also wrote to me that for the past five years, every year, she engages in this annual silent retreat at Rivendell. We've been in a sermon series now as of uh, last week on what it looks like to live with intentional rhythms for life, or what the monks call a rule of life, a way of life that supports our most life-giving relationship of all, our relationship with God, and the most important priorities in our life. People who live with intentional rules of life may, like Sandy, have certain annual rhythms, like a retreat that draws them closer to God or maybe a yearly vacation where they experience rest and renewal. People who live by intentional rhythms of life may also have weekly rituals, like a Sabbath practice, which we looked at last Sunday, which can be a palace in time where we slow down. I mentioned last week that life is too short to be in a hurry, and Sabbath can be a palace in time where we luxuriate in time and delight in God, delight in life itself, and delight in the most important people in our world. People who live with intentional rhythms or rules of life may also have certain daily practices. I mentioned last Sunday that I've written a book called God in My Everything, How an Ancient Rhythm Helps Busy People Enjoy God that describes what it's like to craft a rule or rhythm of life. I also mentioned that in the back of the book, there are several examples of real people, some of whom are connected to this faith community, and uh, how they craft, how they write out their rule of life. And there are copies available in the Upper East Hall afterwards. All the proceeds from book sales go to missions that work with vulnerable children like World Vision. But if you can't afford the cover price, it's $10. Feel free to take a book as a gift from me. I've set aside some of my own money to do just that. I'd be honored to give you a copy of the book. And if you're watching online, you can come by the church anytime to pick up a copy as well. I also mentioned last week that I've created this worksheet inspired by one of the rules of life of someone featured in the book. And uh, this person likes to use, I think, Excel spreadsheets. And so uh, she, uh, um, she puts together a, a rule of life worksheet with, with various squares. And uh, I've put some categories in like prayer and silence, practices like scripture reading and reading for growth, care for the body, relationships, Sabbath and play, work and so forth. And then in a separate category, I've listed how you might consider a rhythm for some of these practices should you engage in them like daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly as well. I just want to mention, I see some people standing in the back. You're welcome to come. There are some seats near the front. I promise I will not bring you into the message should you come right to the front. <laughs> no honey giveaway this, this, this Sunday. There was one last Sunday as well. So yeah, come on in and sit wherever you want. Today, we're going to be looking at the daily rhythm or the potentially daily rhythm of prayer. Uh, let me also mention, if you're online or if you're here in person and you want to download this Rule of Life worksheet, you can go to 10th.ca forward slash Rule of Life and, and download it as a PDF. Today we're going to be looking at the rhythm or the potential rhythm of daily prayer. 
We read in the gospel in Luke 4, 42. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place to pray. And then similarly in the gospel of Luke chapter 5, verse 16, we read, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Let's take a moment to pray ourselves. Living God, we thank you that you became one of us, a human being in Jesus Christ that first Christmas. And in so doing, you showed us how to live. And we thank you that, that you, as a human being, prayed and you took time for solitude. We pray that your example in Jesus would inspire us to connect regularly and deeply with you in ways that bring life. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we don't know a lot of the details about the content of Jesus' prayers. We know some of those details, but not many of them. Uh, we do know, according to Luke chapter 6, that early on in his ministry, Jesus went off to a mountain, prayed all night, and at the end of that time, Jesus chose his original 12 students or disciples. We also know that near the end of his earthly ministry, Jesus went into a garden called Gethsemane, and he also prayed all night, seeking to determine whether it was God's will for him to lay his life down on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. So we know that there were times when Jesus engaged in intense times of prayer, seeking wisdom and discernment. But we also know from the passages that we read today that Jesus, at times, wanted to get away from the demands the noise and the clamor of the crowds and seek God his Father in solitary, lonely places so that he would experience rest and renewal and strength with God. Now, when we think of prayer, many of us think about talking, talking, talking. And prayer obviously can involve words. When we are seeking direction for something, we'll likely put our question into words as we converse with God. When we're praying for other people, we'll probably, almost certainly, use words. When there is something heavy on our heart, when we're feeling anxious, and we cry out to God, we're probably going to use words. In fact, Paul encourages us to do just that in that circumstance when he says, do not be anxious about anything. This is from Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Do not be anxious, even if you're worried about that phone call. <laughs> but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So, of course, we can and at times ought to use words in prayer. Sometimes naming something can be very helpful for us even as we pray. But we can also engage in a kind of prayer where we simply in silence enjoy the presence of God. In Psalm 46.10, God says, Be still and know that I am God. The Canadian Catholic writer on the spiritual life, Ronald Rollheiser, describes prayer as, quote, relaxing into God. And we can do that in silence. If God knows everything, and God does, and if God knows what we will pray even before we will actually pray it, which God does according to Scripture, then we don't necessarily need to use words in our prayer. We can simply, as Rollheiser says, relax into God, into God's presence in silence. And my preferred way to pray is to relax into God's presence in silence. I've shared part of my rhythm with some of you before, but let me recap at least a section of it. In the morning, first thing, I, I get up and I like to go on a run with our golden retriever, Sasha, in our neighborhood or go to one of the local pools and, and head into the water for a swim, come back home, and I'll often sit, perhaps light a candle, and engage in something called silent centering prayer. 
And as part of my rhythm of life or rule of life, I will not check my messages before I've had this time of silent meditative prayer. Now, I'm easily distracted, so that's a helpful practice for me. But let me just take a moment to talk about devices, okay? Uh, It's very convenient to have an iPhone or some kind of smartphone, but as many of us know, these can be very distracting as well. Companies and apps collectively spend billions of dollars seeking to get our attention and keep our attention. And they know that when we're distracted by something they've created, they're making money. And when we're not distracted, they're not making money. Johan Hari, the author of the book Stolen Focus, writes, when you are tempted to put your phone down, the site keeps drip-feeding you the kind of material that it has learned from your past behavior, from your algorithm, keeps you scrolling. So they know what your past behavior is in terms of your searches, and they keep feeding you information or material that they think will keep you scrolling. Our friend Andy Crouch, the author of TechWise Family, has some great wisdom around how we can relate or not relate to our devices and screens. And as part of Andy's rule of life, he will not check his devices until he has spent some time in nature in the morning. And for nature, for Andy, that might simply mean walking into his yard. And he says that part of my rule of life also includes at least one hour where I am free from screens or devices each day. And one day, at least each week, when I am free of screens or devices, I suppose an exception might be if he really intentionally wants to view, say, a film. And then one week a year, I am device and screen free. That's Andy Crouch's, well, part of his rule of life, the author of TechWise family. I would also commend to you the wisdom of Ross Laird. He's a Vancouver-based consultant who works with people that are struggling to overcome addictions. He gave a talk here some years ago entitled Kids, Screens, and the Tangled Web. It's available on our website. You can simply Google it with uh, the words 10th Church and find it. But when he gave his talk, I was here in person for that, Uh, My wife and I thought, wow, you've got some good ideas. Joey, our son, was a young boy at the time. We set some screen time limits for him, which was great. We could have done it for ourselves as well. He gave some great ideas around not using Wi-Fi connected devices in private spaces in your home, private rooms, putting your phone and devices to sleep in another part of the house. Again, you can glean his insights from this uh, talk called Kids, Screen Time, and the Tangled Web, available on our website. It can be helpful to include in our rule of life things like our relationship, how we'll use our devices and how we won't, and how we'll use our notification settings and so forth, so we're not being distracted and bugged all the time by our phones and devices. Now, back to, I was talking about my prayer practice, right? So, I, I begin... Uh, By sitting in silence, I won't check my messages, but I will pick up my phone to open up an app called Pray As You Go. It's created by the Jesuits in England, and they put together a daily meditation, 10 to maybe 12 minutes, that typically begins with some kind of song, some kind of spiritual song. I think we've got an example of one that that we can uh, play from the app and website prays you go. So go ahead. All of the sound sings. I told you he's from England, right? These guys. Abide those. with me. As you hear these words, can you hear that invitation from the Lord to be near to Him? Yeah. 
usually begins with some kind of song, maybe a classical hymn like Abide With Me, or maybe an ancient chant like a Gregorian chant, or maybe a contemporary song, but there's usually some kind of music or song that sort of orients us toward God. And then the host, whoever he or she is, will read a passage, maybe from the Gospels or from the Psalms, ask some questions, leads us through a guided meditation that lasts about 10, 11, 12 minutes. So that's how I begin my meditation. And then I open up a free app called Centering Prayer. Praise You Go is also free. And I set a timer to maybe 20, 25, 30 minutes. So I'm not thinking about the time. I really am easily distracted. So I don't want to be thinking how much time has gone by, even as I'm in silence. And uh, the app has a begin button. with a chime that makes me think I'm in a monastery being summoned to pray by a bell. And I will then take some time to simply breathe deeply, breathing in through my nose, deeply exhaling slowly, breathing in deeply, exhaling slowly. And as my mind wanders, and it will, I will use a sacred word like love or peace as a way to remind myself that I'm in the presence of a God who loves me, a God who imparts peace, and as a way to focus my mind and spirit a little more on God. When I'm done, the meditation, the silence, I almost always feel a little more relaxed, focused, and throughout the day, just a bit more aware of Jesus's presence. So part of my simple routine. Some of you would know Pablo Angelo, He's part of our faith community here at 10th, originally from Latin America. Occasionally, like Leanne uh, did today, he, he hosts our service as he did on uh, Sunday, January the 1st. Pablo wrote me an email recently and has given me permission to share it as it describes part of his own prayer practice. Pablo writes, My one-on-one -on -one time with God my Father is perhaps the most relevant part of my day. I love it, protect it, long for it. Quite a few years ago, when I was a teenager... Pablo says, I decided I wanted to start reading my Bible on a daily basis with the help of a devotional booklet. And by the way, if you're thinking about cultivating a prayer life, it can be helpful to have an app like Pray As You Go or a devotional booklet that can help to so, sort of orient uh, and warm your heart toward, toward God. Pablo continues, without knowing or without having words for it, over the years, that daily practice slowly became a rule of life that included praying, which for him means speaking to God, Bible reading and meditation, which refers to contemplating God or God's truth in silence. And even though things have changed, I've changed, Pablo says, that daily practice of spending time with God, my Father, has gotten better, richer, and definitely meaningful. Pablo says, when I was a teenager, I was certainly not waking up in the middle of the morning to read my Bible. That was not happening. But as time passed, and as I grew up and matured, I became a morning person and naturally and gradually changed my prayer and devotional time to first thing in the morning. Now, let me just comment here for a moment. Pablo here is describing a chronotype which is fairly typical. Teenagers often want to stay up late. They've got more energy late at night. But as they grow into adulthood, often they become more alert in the morning. But that doesn't happen for everyone. So for example, Barack Obama has remained a late night owl. So this, uh, his uh, change isn't necessarily true for everyone, Pablo's change. Since then, I always wake up ahead of time, take a few minutes to refresh, put the kettle on for tea, and then sit in my chair by the window in my suite and go into what is perhaps the best time of my day as I spend time talking one-on-one -on -one with my Father to Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Every morning when I pray, I tell him about things that have happened recently, about my recent experiences. I also pray for people. I love praying for people. If you need prayer, talk to Pablo. And for the church and the world and many other things. So it sounds like for Pablo that over time his prayer life has gotten richer and more meaningful. For a lot of us, I'm sure this is true to some extent. For Pablo too, it's certainly true for me. Our prayer time can be up and down, up and down, up and down. I'm easily distracted as I mentioned and 
at any given time, I can feel like there are 132 monkeys jumping around in my head. But I'm encouraged by the words of Thomas Keating, who says, even if you are distracted 10,000 times in a particular prayer time, those are 10,000 opportunities to turn back to God, to exercise that, that spiritual and neurological muscle of, of refocusing on God. There are also some people for whom, given their life situation, it's very difficult to structure in extended times of prayer. Leanne mentioned that over the pandemic, she, quote, popped out two babies. So that's a memorable expression. And it's good to connect with, uh, with your, with your uh, kids, uh, Jericho and Asa, after the, uh, the first service. You know, for a lot of newborn, um, well, not newborn babies, I mean, they're probably naturally praying in some, their own way, but for mothers of newborns, uh, it's hard to find long stretches of time to engage in formal prayer. Mothers in this community have told me that as they are breastfeeding their child, that they can enter into a kind of prayerful, meditative silence. I was talking to someone this past week in our community who is a physician at uh, the ER, and he says, given the time I have to begin my shift these days, I can't in engage in a devotional time, a formal devotional time before work, but there are periods of my day when I'm at the hospital, where I can pause and direct my conscious attention toward God, which is a form of prayer. I know there are some folks here in the community that use their commute time to listen to the scriptures through an audio app like Bible in One Year with Nikki Gumbel, who is the pioneer of the Alpha Course that we heard about earlier. So there will be seasons in life where it will be difficult to structure our lives with extended times of formal prayer, but most of us, perhaps even all of us, could create with God's guidance some kind of rhythm where we connect consciously with God every day. It'll look different for different people, depending on time and circumstances. And it may not be an overstatement to say that in this period of our history in the world, there may be no time where prayer for the world and prayer for the prayer, the person praying, is more needed. Listen to what Daniel Goleman writes. Daniel Goleman is a psychologist, an author who has written about emotional intelligence. He's the person who coined the expression emotional intelligence. He says that we live in an age of melancholy. Listen to his words. Each successive generation worldwide since the opening of the century, meaning the 20th century, has lived with a higher risk than their parents of suffering a major depression. Not just sadness, but a paralyzing listlessness, dejection and self-pity, and an overwhelming hopelessness over the course of life. And those episodes are beginning at earlier and earlier ages. Childhood depression, once virtually unknown or at least unrecognized, is emerging as a fixture of the modern scene. And similarly, Jean Twenge, who is a professor of psychology at San Diego State University and the author of a book called iGen, spelled I, lowercase i, gen, big G, E N points out that iGen, the generation also known as Generation Z, born between 1995 and 2012, is experiencing more anxiety, more depression, more mental health issues than any generation that has preceded them. And Professor Twenge also makes the observation that iGen is the first generation that was born into a world immersed with the iPhone, the iPad, and other electronic devices. And so she postulates that because this generation is spending more time in front of screens and less time interacting with people face to face, they are more isolated and therefore they tend to be more anxious and depressed. We live in an age, sadly, where sadness itself and anxiety and depression is pervasive. And so in this context, it is not only a calling but it is a gift, a gift. Yes, young fellow, beware of too much time in front of a screen. 
It's not only a calling, but a, it just, a, a gift to be able to spend time in the presence of God, who is the most joyous being in the universe. And as we spend time with this most joyous of beings, we will receive that joy. We will receive the wish of the Apostle Paul that he expresses in Romans 15, 13, when he says, may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace so that you may overflow with hope with the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul Tillich, the theologian, points out there is a difference between solitude and loneliness. Tillich says that solitude is the glory of being alone. Loneliness is the pain of being alone. And there's a difference. And when we are with God alone, we can experience the glory of solitude, which can mitigate, can shrink our sense of of loneliness as we feel connected to our maker. Prayer, particularly meditative prayer, can also shape the way we experience the world in terms of peace versus joy. I regularly quoted uh, Dr. Kelly McGonigal, a psychologist who teaches at Stanford. Some of you have heard. She makes the point that if you meditate for as little as 15 or 20 minutes a day, over four to six weeks, and then we were to do an fMRI scan in your brain, the scan would show that the neural networks in your brain associated with feeling anxiety and depression have actually shrunk, and the joy center in your brain, which can keep growing throughout your entire lifetime, has actually visibly grown. And as we experience more joy in the presence of God through prayer, through meditation, we will have more love to give. Hilary McBride is a psychologist who began her work here in Vancouver, is now on the island. She's spoken here a couple of times at 10th, and uh, she'll be speaking again on Friday evening, February 24th. If you want more information, you can go to 10th.ca forward slash Hillary. And if you want a promo code, if someone took uh, at one of the earlier services, you can simply type in the promo code 10th, T-E-N-T-H, and you get a two-thirds discount. Hillary will be speaking on the wisdom of the body. And she has said from this platform that if you will meditate for as little as 20 minutes a day for five to six weeks in a row, and then a disabled person were to walk in the room, you'll be like 100 times more likely to respond to that person. When you become a more joyful person, be it through meditation or through some other means, you will have more love to give. Someone has said, when you make joy a habit, love becomes a reflex. When you make joy a habit, love becomes a reflex. The more joy you have, the more you have to give. So spending time in prayer is not a selfish activity at all. I mentioned earlier that some people will find it difficult, you know, based on your life circumstances, to have extended times of prayer in a structured way, but we can all build in some kind of rhythm of prayer with, 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 with God's help. And as I was saying to someone after one of the earlier services who wants to establish a new rhythm of prayer in his own life, it'll take some effort. It'll take some initiative to get started. Grace and effort are not at odds with each other. We know what effort means. Grace means the gift of God. But effort and God's gift or grace are not at odds with each other. Dallas Willard, the great writer on the spiritual life, said, grace is not opposed to effort. It is opposed to earning. And there's a difference. Grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. We can't earn the favor of God, but we can work with God to receive more of his life into our life. Paul says, train yourself to be godly in Scripture. In Hebrews 11.6, we read, God rewards those who diligently seek him. And yes, we give something to prayer, which requires effort, especially at first, to get that ritual established. But we also receive from this practice as well. It's like some of you know, who physically exercise. That yes, it takes time, it takes effort, but you also receive back from that practice as well. 
You make joy a habit through prayer and love will be a reflex and you'll find yourself lifted up. You know, in my own life, I find that if I'm facing down a typical day, maybe 20 or 30 minutes of silent meditative prayer will be enough. But if I am facing an unusually challenging, potentially stressful day because I've got a big decision to make or I'm about to face down a crucial conversation or because I just feel a great weight upon me, 20 or 30 minutes don't feel like they're enough. I need an hour, maybe even more, just to luxuriate in God's presence. And coming out of that time, I will feel more focused, more relaxed, more at peace, more joy, more love, more courage, more fierceness, if that's what is needed. This is the kind of practice that gives life. It is a lifeline. And so it can be for you as well. It's been that way for Pablo, for Sandy, who I mentioned earlier. It can be that way for you as well. Jesus understood this. And so there were times when he got away from the busyness and the noise of the crowds to seek his father's face in solitude so that he could experience joy and strength in God. And we can follow in Jesus' footsteps and we can break away and spend time consciously in God's presence and in so doing experience real joy, peace, and strength in and with God. Let's pray together. Do you sense that God, God's Spirit, is inviting you to connect with Him daily in some way? If so, take a moment to talk to God about that. Maybe say, God, I, I want to do this. There's a part of me that wants to connect deeply with you. Help me and show me how to do this. Help me and show me how to do this. And as you pray that prayer in the coming days, weeks, months, and years, as Paul prayed for you, may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you trust him so that you may overflow with hope in the power of the Holy Spirit. May it be so. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.